My name is Vanessa Chang, and I'm a curator, writer, and educator. Today, I'm speaking to you from Yelamu, also known as San Francisco, on the unceded territories of the Ramatush Ohlone people. This panel discussion, Robots and Art, is brought to you by Immersive Arts Alliance. Based in the San Francisco Bay Area, Immersive Arts Alliance supports collaboration between international and local artists working with new, um, with new media technologies, creating experiences that break down the barrier between art and audience. A newly formed nonprofit, we partner with Bay Area arts organizations to bring large scale visionary projects to life. Immersive Arts Alliance also engages the public in vital forums and discussions about the impact of art and technology on creativity and culture at large. Today's event, Robots and Art, explores what robots make possible in artistic practice. Our guests all integrate robots and robotics into their artistic practice in provocative ways. Together, we'll delve into this special form of interspecies collaboration. We'll begin by introducing each of our discussants, upon which they will share a little bit about their work. After this, we'll expand into a broader discussion. For those of you watching, if you have a question, please feel free to pop your question into the Q&A box at any time. If the timing is right, we'll bring it up during the conversation. If not, we'll get to it during um, at the end of the hour. Uh, without further ado then, let's begin. Um, I'd like to open by introducing Agnieszka Pilat. Polish-born artist Agnieszka Pilat is best known for her series of heroic portraits of technology and machines. She's been artist in residence at Waymo, Google's self-driving car project, Autodesk, Wright Speed, an electrical vehicle startup founded by Tesla co-founder Ian Wright, and is a guest artist in residence at Boston Dynamics. She's a part of the Silver Arts Program at the World Trade Center in New York City, and as a self-proclaimed machine chaser, commutes between the East and West Coasts in pursuit of emergent technologies. Agnieszka, would you like to share um, some of your work with us? Hi, okay, let me see how I, if I'm good at this technology thing and try to share my screen here. Um, all right. So, uh, so yeah, so I do paint portraits of technology and uh, why portraits? Well, um, uh, the idea, I was trained as a portrait painter and just quickly to explain, uh, historically, when we think about portraiture, it generally follows the, the arc of power in society or in culture. So, you know, through religious portraiture, through aristocracy, and um, through celebrity portraiture with Andy Warhol, uh, I think now we are in time in history that technology holds the reins of power. Hence, I approach technology in portraiture. Uh, the one you are seeing here, this was executed at Boston Dynamics. These are uh, spot arms. Uh, and um, I clicked on the next one, but um, let me play this and kind of explain why I'm doing this. So this is a painting I finished at Boston Dynamics, and this is Spot. And you know, when I think when we think about art and portraiture, we think about uh, the idea of uh, patronage, and also that still goes back to who holds power. So. Um, going into the future, I have to kind of um, consider who are going to be my patrons in the future. And hence, this is a bit tongue in cheek, how robot relates to its own portrait. Um, and I want to show one more slide, just one more slide. Uh, so this, and in the, in the new work that especially I did at Boston Dynamics and going forward, all the paintings will have an air, a layer of AR. And it's, there is a lot of, um, that plugs into a lot of um, paradoxes in my work. So when you think about painting, painting is still, machine is about movement and action. So that's one of the paradoxes. Another paradox is machines are mass, mass produced, of course. Uh, origin, paintings are original and unique. So there's a number of them I can go back, uh, but just to embrace one of these paradoxes, which is movement, I use AR now. So this is very short, just shows how it works. Uh, it's an open source app and um, it activates um, whatever animation we want to build into it. Um, so that's kind of a short introduction. I hope that was good enough. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. Really um, fascinating and moving work. Like I, I feel very fond of some of the, the images that you've shown. All right, um, I'd like now to introduce Katie Kwan. 
Katie Kwan is a dancer, choreographer, and roboticist. She is currently a PhD candidate in the Mecha Mechanical Engineering Department at Stanford University, where she recently completed a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Her research and artistic work focuses on robotics, haptics, learning from demonstration, dance, and human-robot interaction. Katie has held artistic residencies at ThoughtWorks Arts, TED, and the Rad Lab, and directed her own dance company, Katie Kwan Dance, for six years in New York City. Katie, would you like to share some of your work with us? Thanks, Vanessa. I will demonstrate my clickability as well, and I'll go ahead and share from this slide. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been dancing with robots for a number of years now, and why that experience became impactful for me and why I continue to make work with robots is because the process of getting to program a machine and then being able to interact with it physically became a really rich embodied experience for me. And that's something that I try to provide to audiences and any of the, the works that I make is this like visceral interactive body-based experience. Um, so this piece I'll call out is called Output and it was created while I was in residence at ThoughtWorks Arts in summer 2018. This is the ABB IRB 6700 robot. It's one of the largest industrial robots on the East Coast. And this is at the Consortium for Research and Robotics at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is associated with Pratt. And they typically use this robot for denting stiff materials. And you can see they actually have it in a Zen garden on the left-hand side of this photo. Uh, but I was thinking that industrial robots have been around for quite a while. And because they're so dangerous for people, not a lot of human beings have interacted with them physically, even though we interact with the byproducts of these types of machines all the time since they're engaged in you know, um, they fill little vials for, for medicine and they also dent silicone and, and they're engaged in the manufacturing of a variety of projects of products that we use, but we don't actually touch them directly. So um, with this robot, I'll kind of skip over how we choreographed it and maybe just refer a little bit to Agnieszka's kind of uh, thing that she's also started to work with recently. So this robot, I wanted to make this presence tangible and known for people. And so we created, um, this hasn't been released yet, but this is an augmented reality application where you can see the robot in your own environment. So you get a sense of the scale and size. Um, you see a little snippet of the piece that was created, which is this kind of middle section in the bottom with me dancing with the robot and showing some of the robot choreography. And then you can try some of that choreography on for yourself in this uh, left-hand panel, kind of see yourself interpreting the robot motion, my motion, and then send it to me as an artist. And we're creating a generative model to build new choreography off of people's user submissions. So this for me is, is an example of something I'm thinking a lot about lately of how do we take these typically inaccessible and dangerous machines and make them visceral and known for the audience um, just so we can start to re reframe them for ourselves rather than reframe them in the kind of broader Western stereotyped um, vision of what a robot can be or what it can do. So looking forward to more of our discussion and I'll stop with all of the complex diagrams for the time being. Thanks, Vanessa. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, finally, I'd like to um, introduce Kurime Batliner. Kurime Batliner is an artist, architect, and educator. His work has been exhibited at Design Miami, Mextropoli, Museo Nacional de Art, Mexico, and he has worked with brands such as Creative Artists Agency, Oblong Industries, and TBWA. His design research is published at the ICRA IEE International Conference for Robotics and Automation, as well as Robotics in Architecture. He is a faculty and researcher in the Robotics Lab of the Southern California Institute of Architecture, we explores both human machine interfaces and analog digital workflows for creative ideation and production. Kurume, would you like to tell us about your work? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me here with uh, all these wonderful uh, colleagues. Um, prepping for this uh, introduction, I thought upon some of the questions which we went over uh, in the prep for this as well, 
a discussion I was part of with Kefi last week. And so I'm going to tell a little bit like the story of myself and how I got into this and how it kind of allowed me to explore certain ideas, but also kind of explains a little bit on how you kind of get started with this kind of work and where it kind of leads along. Um, so uh, my enthusiasm for robotics really started when I came as a student to California about a decade ago. And I was fortunate to uh, find a culture and environment that really nurtured the concept of personal exploration. Uh, I was also blessed to call it with my curiosity with trust and freedom. And so I really entered this field through the lens of architecture and my approach to the subject has always been in one way or another through, through space. At that time, I was obsessed with telling stories through software and fascinated with the possibility of moving between digital space in the computer and the physical space in the lab. So starting out, we all usually in this field kind of faced the challenge of control. So back then I had a traditional education in architecture and did not know much about coding as well robotics, but I did know quite something about people and animation. And so we started forward with a team of three and learned some techniques from the VFX industry. And so we tamed the beast by building a visual imaginative apparatus that feathered all actors to a timeline and invited us to play. So the objective since then has rarely been a finished product, but much more a project of translations where the goal is to keep the play going and where the animal meets the digital, the digital meets the analog and somewhere in between is us and the machine. Um, over time, we've gained skill or mainly like uh, confidence, I would say. Uh, one starts to kind of pushing and pushing kind of crazier and crazier kind of ways on how these machines move with one. And so we cannot get around the idea of choreography. And so the images here we see are different uh, concepts of it, but really like some which are like between bodies, meaning machines and humans dancing with each other, machines interacting with machines, but then also the, the choreography between an active material which hasn't settled yet and needs to be kind of synchronized uh, with the machine. So both the flow of information and matter and the direction of it really becomes uh, important and then also lends itself to ideas of interactivity and synchronicity across software and, and, and hardware as well as machine actors and, 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 and normal actors. And so speaking about embodiment, Katie touched before upon this, robotics are very embodied uh, a discipline. And so while a lot of the work originally took place within uh, lab environments, I got really curious about, first of all, changing my own environment and going outside into places, uh, but then also like seeing how the public could interact with this work and how the work itself would change uh, by doing so. So putting it all kind of together, I think it's, uh, it's important robotics is an embodied uh, um, uh, field. And so these slides kind of represent where I'm today, um, where I'm really looking at this as a platform which allows me to delve into different types of kind of research and technologies as robotics really is like an, a platform uh, which converge, uh, has like this thing where multiple technologies and ideas converge. So today I'm thinking a lot about automation, access, uh, and in some ways all the interspecies and how all these things can start speaking to another and unlock kind of new fields of creativity. So I don't wanna to go to off too much on, so starting out into closing my thing, I think it's important to highlight uh, the humanity which comes with these technologies and as well the importance of the images and stories that we, are, uh, that we articulate and share uh, when we explore what we think is artificial and natural. So I very look forward to this and uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, wow, so much, uh, so much, so many different ways all of you explore the possibilities of using robotics in your work. Um, I'd like to start with some of maybe the, the continuities that I'm seeing. So something that, um, that really pops out at me um, from all of your work is this interest in this human robot relation. Right, it's not simply about you know ro robots being there, but kind of like how you know emotionally we might respond to robots or chore you know choreographically. Karine, both you and Katie speak about choreography um, and bodies in space when you're talking about robotics and this being kind of really central to this human robotic relation. Can you um, speak a bit about that that sense of that interrelationship of humans and robots and how that informs your work? 
I can jump in here for sure. Um, so there's there's both a good Ken Goldberg, iconic, you know, artist, Bay Area researcher, uh, professor at Berkeley, and also Shakespeare quote about how both theater and robotics is hold a mirror up to nature or a mirror as it were. And so the relationship, at least from the offset, is one where human beings are in control of the artifact, which is the robot. And then they also become slave to that artifact, or as Karime said, you know, completely um, in the in the land of frustration and trying to up your confidence when it comes to control. I love that expression. I'm not sure I've become much more skilled either, but I feel more confident for sure than I did a couple of years ago. So I think at least when you look at the kind of temporal nature of a human's relationship to a robot, it's one of an imagination or a figment of possibility then a sort of servile relationship of the human is in service to the artifact and then winds up becoming doubly in service to the artifact once it's been made and it's hard to use. Um, and then I think there's kind of this like third, maybe ephemeral human robot relationship piece, which is like the, the possibility of the unknown or like what can we do now that we have this, this entity that's been created and can move autonomously. Uh, and for me, I think much of my work is really entrenched in this idea of control and who, who is in charge of the interactions that we create um, and for what purpose. And you know, the conclusion that I've come to largely is that control is a, it's a perceptual phenomenon perhaps rather than a real one. Um, wow. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think control is, um, I think at the beginning we all struggle and then, and uh, as, and as I said before, or as Kathy highlighted again, it's, um, it's a game of confidence in many ways because we like, we, for, I think it's in all fields anyway, but we are like entering another one, which is very, we, we st stand on the shoulders of giants really, uh, who have made these things accessible to us. Um, but then I think it's also important to kind of recognize the contributions that we can bring. Uh, because for instance, like working with industrial robots, these machines are not, were never designed to do anything what we all of here are sharing today. And, and because this was all about optimization, optimization and, and it was kind of the reflection of the capitalist model we're in it, right? So just like trying to optimize. And so I think what we can do is, is, is like, dabble in these technologies and, 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 and obviously like learn about it, but at the same time also kind of expand on what is possible with it. So I like this space of the imagination when it comes to this with machines. Um, I'm less interested in automation. I mean, I sometimes try to automate things just because obviously we wanna also be a little bit efficient, but it's never the goal of like the highest throughput. It's more than always like a, game of understanding. And so I enjoy very much finding that these machines, which are highly optimized, are not perfect. Um, they have lots of issues or quirks, which we kind of work around. And actually us as humans are very qualified and kind of bridging uh, as a sensor, but also like kind of as, uh, as a like, uh, well, as the brain in many ways to kind of bridge between things uh, and subjects where these machines on their own could not could not, and so I like the idea of the. I like multiple ideas of uh, of choreography, but definitely also one of the kind of the digital craftsman or craftswoman who has like augmented and is kind of in a, you know, in a conversation with this technology. Agnieszka, would like, you like to add anything? Yeah. Um. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I kind of like what Katie said. I mean, it's all an illusion, the control that we have it or we don't have it. So it's just a conversation, a story we're telling ourselves. Uh, for me, my first account encounter at Boston Dynamics, uh, when I first came in and I first saw their big robot, uh, um, act as the humanoid robot. And, uh, and the fact that I was not really watching it being, uh, that it was of course being operated, and for me to see that kind of mechanical huge creature on the ground lying in a position like a fetal position and getting up with an illusion of agency on its own was actually a spiritual experience. But it's an illusion, of course. Uh, so um, 
now I would tie it into uh, authenticity of these robots in the sense that they don't pretend. And that's why I like industrial robots like you guys, because I think when you cross over to, um, you know, Bina 48 or 49 and, you know, other uh, Android robots that look too close to us, then it becomes very creepy. Uh, but because these are industrial robots and if we yeah, make them move almost like human or organic beings, this is a wonderful clash of confusion, but it's not creepy. Um, maybe that's my comment, I guess. So what I'm hearing, um, and please correct me if I'm not hearing this right, is that part of the, the charge of using industrial robots is that because they are optimized, because they're so precise, that interaction we have them can kind of disrupt the illusion of control that we exercise through those robots. Would, that, would you say that's fair? Hmm. Um. Can you rephrase the question? I'm not sure. Yeah. I can... yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a kind of charge and something, Karima, you talk about the space of the imagination as well when working with these industrial robots that poses a challenge to um, in optimization and control um, and, and that by kind of placing these industrial robots within these artistic spaces, that it can also disrupt the control that we have as humans or the sense of control that we try to exert through these machines. Yeah. I suppose so, yes. Because <laughs> uh -huh. as an Agnieszka, there's an incredible vulnerability, for example, in the work that you create. You know, that when I'm looking at a Boston Dynamics robot observing its own portraiture, and you talk too about power um, and patronage and portraiture as a, in the power of patronage, um, it's extremely evocative, right? Like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that this robot is looking at its own portrait and thinking, yeah, yeah, you know, that's pretty accurate. I quite like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I do like, I do like, I like paradoxes and these clashes that also Kurima talked about. So yeah, the paradox again of this uh, self of agency from a robot and that goes for, for AI too. I mean, we know it's all, all an illusion, it's all controlled or pre-programmed. So it's, yeah, so these paradoxes are just wonderful and, uh, um, but in general, yeah, I think these are, they are very fragile. And also uh, when you work with these big industrial models, you realize that humans are in charge and actually they are, I kind of almost refer to them as brothers in arms or our children, children of humanity. So um, hopefully, you know, at some point as the science grows around it, uh, they're gonna have more agency, but for now they're just like children and we just, uh, you know, lead them wherever we want. And um, that's why I paint them sometimes silly also, because they're like kids who, who try to act like adults, but they don't know what they're doing. It's all very new technologies. So it's charming in that way. Vanessa, I want to remark upon your question with sort of two very tangible anecdotes to, I think you've talked about by placing these presumably controllable entities inside of a performance specifically, which is my medium um, structure, you know, do you disrupt some of those edges a little? And so I worked with a now robot, which is a very widely accessible commercial robot from SoftBank Robotics in a dance that I did prior to my TED talk back in 2018. And we had run this dance probably 200 times. And then of course the audience arrives uh, I've got the robot, I'm under the sheet, I'm preset like we've done X number of times for X number of weeks and immediately the robot shuts off because it's overheated. And it was the perfect confluence of heat contained under this white king size sheet and me being very nervous and the robot having been on for just a couple minutes too long and the robot turned off and all of the lights were down and the music came up and I couldn't do the piece, right? And it was intrinsic or the the burden of control or adaptation was squarely on my shoulder. So we take the robot backstage, we turn it on and off, we reset everything, we reset the Wi-Fi network, we come back on on stage and I get back under the sheet. And so I think for me, that was like a very obvious instance where I had so presumed this predictability from these robots. And granted, this robot is less predictable than an ABB. Um, it's just 
less tested in these very robust repetitive environments. But I was like so convinced of this robot's ability to perform exactly how I had imagined it. And then literally in the exact minute, um, the robot shut off. And then just to extend that story slightly, there was in this dance, there was a juncture in the dance where I kick the robot over and it's meant to be an indication of like, I'm in charge, I am I run this environment, now is the time for me to demonstrate my human flourishing. And literally again, at that exact moment when I was supposed to kick it over, the robot overheated, it did this sort of collapsing behavior and it fell back on all fours. And it looked like this very vulnerable, Agnieszka had kind of talked about with Atlas, this totally emotionally evocative, vulnerable moment where the robot, and it completely changed the piece. It went from being this piece of human reclamation to this piece of, oh, I'm cradling this object that has failed. And so I think for me, the presumption of control, those questions are questions that I've experienced inside of the moment of performance when it's like, no, there is something you know, enigmatic and magical happening that I cannot fathom. And it is occurring at these, ex and I could, I mean, I could have maybe 10 or 12 stories like that. And so I don't know, like, I, I think any engineer and myself included, if I put that side of my brain on, would be like, well, there's nothing fundamentally, fundamentally spiritual, unique or unusual happening, but it feels that way as a performer when these instances keep occurring in the precise moment when it is meant to be demonstrated to an audience. I love that. I love that. And kind of the, the way that you describe the burden of adaptability suddenly being turned back upon yourself. Um, it seems to me in all, in all of your work, there's this staging of, um, I mean, it's not always staging. Sometimes it's this genuine encounter of vulnerability, right? It's your, your own vulnerability and as well as the kind of um, the vulnerability of the machines and systems that you're using. Um, what might you say, I mean, Katie, Katie, Kurime, Agnieszka, what would you say the role of that vulnerability or more broadly of like feeling and emotions and intimacy might be in your work? Well, I develop a very personal relationship with them. So when I first came to Boston Dynamics, uh, they gave me like a generic spot to play with and, uh, and they were very trustful and like, yeah, take it out for a walk. So I took it out for a walk. Of course, I didn't understand. They don't understand glass. So he walked into the glass very uh, dramatically and he got a scratch. And so uh, because I was painting on the paint, working on the painting based on Marcel Duchamp's um, work, I called the robot Marcella. And then I knew exactly that it had the scratch. And if they would want me, bring me some other one, I'd be like, no, I want Marcella. So um, I definitely developed um, yeah, relationships with these machines. It's very intimate and uh, yeah, we tell our sort of story, definitely. Yes, I mean, I mean, I don't know if it's you guys, but I mean, the first thing you do is you give them a name if they don't already have one um, when you start working. But then I think like a lot of this intimacy or like personal thing comes to it when you actually has a little bit to do with this idea of control. So for instance, like I draw a lot with these machines. And so it's really about like once you get over a certain stage, let's say of confidence and you, you, you think you can like repeat certain experiments and thing, you come into a stage of refinement, you start writing your own software that it more and more starts doing in some way, interacting with you um, how you want. So like, and not just a robot, like before we, we spoke about it, like more in like kind of a self-contained way, but like once it like starts interacting with matter, right? You start extruding material, etc it's not as predictable anymore, this material. So then it becomes this game where you have to like have certain sensibilities and understanding, not just to the machine, but also to the material, to the temperature in the room, your own uh, thing. And all of that gets mixed into the interfaces you write. So you write your software. And so then it becomes very, very personal, this hard work. And, and so that's why um, I like to say this is a game of sensibilities, the work um, at that point. And so I like industrial robots because they're to a certain degree reliable. Obviously like the, the newer the tech, the harder, like the more false they are. Like industrial robots are like fairly um, like reliable in this way. But the second you start pairing them with material and sensors and, and people, 
um, it becomes again a space which is very um, sensitive and then the way how you approach it uh, makes a big difference to how somebody else approaches it and in that way it's very personal work I would say um, yeah I and mean, it's that's how I see it. which is a paradox which is wonderful because again there are these you know mass-produced machines made to mass-produce things but by developing that relationship uh, you make them unique it's wonderful yeah I mean sorry I don't want to like cut up like but it was funny because last week I was speaking with Kefi and she was talking about how they feel, make you feel, right? And I didn't really speak about it this way, but I have robots here in my studio and sometimes I just put them on to draw so I can watch them, even though I'm working on something else because it, it gives me a certain peace and it's very graceful um, on, on how they move, right? So in, in, in given COVID and all of this, right? Um, you suddenly have like somebody as a next to you, which obviously is not the same, but um, in some ways, um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Karine. That's, um, that's really interesting and kind of this context of COVID as well and um, what it means to, to be alone and what does it mean to sort of be with a machine that you've invested so much in, right? Like that, that, um, that gives, gives you what in some ways you give it. Um, I'd like to, since we've been talking about feeling um, and intimacy a little bit, I'd like to orient the conversation then to the, what is a pretty um, common idea when people are talking about robots, which is intelligence. So artificial intelligence and robots are not the same thing. And um, this, this uh, appears to be a common kind of um, issue, which um, I could invite you to speak about. Um, there's an embodied quality to robots and to robotic arms. They move in the same physical space that we do, but the intelligence that they have is artificial. So I'd like to invite you about um, to speak about that form of intelligence, which is in some ways more impressive than human intelligence, but in other ways not. So um, in Norvig and Russell's artificial intelligence, they write that it may be important to study the underlying principles of intelligence than to duplicate an exemplar. And that the quest for artificial flight succeeded when the Wright brothers and others stopped imitating birds and started using wind tunnels and learning about aerodynamics. So what, what do you each of you find useful regarding robotic intelligence, if that's the term that you would use, or do you think that's kind of conflating robotics and AI in another way? Their robots have very real forms of physical intelligence because they can reach out and touch the world, right? We've all just talked about robots. The types of robots that I work with, you know, for example, not chatbots, they're embodied. Um, and so the benefit there is that they have a new type of intelligence that they can glean from being able to move, so navigate and move around being able to perceive far more dynamic things because they're not fixed and being able to manipulate those things and glean some information about them. Uh, that's a completely different type of intelligence than a robot, for example, that um, doesn't have access to like the forces that you use to open a door, for instance. Um, maybe it could simulate those forces, but actually being able to go out and measure them with a nice force torque sensor inside of a wrist, it just gives you a different fidelity of information. So for me, when I think about the type of robot, so to speak, intelligence or artificial intelligence, robot learning area that I'm really excited about, it's um, Tobias Rees refers to it as like artificial physical intelligence. So what a body can learn that um, uh, maybe standalone statistical, well, not statistical is the wrong word, but like a standalone ML model maybe wouldn't have access to. Um, and I should also remark that, you know, Alison Gopnik, who's a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley, she really studies about how these types of intelligence are also tied to the body that we occupy. So when you're a baby, you're very soft, you're close to the floor. If you smack into things, you're probably not going to break a bone. Um, your bones haven't quite calcified enough versus when you're an adult or much older octogenarian, the stakes of that fall are a lot higher. So like the, the body is tied to the type of exploration and engagement that you can really leverage. Um, so for me, the type of robot learning or robot intelligence that I'm really excited about is this what you can learn about the world through a fully embodied manipulation based mobile interaction uh, versus a kind of like fixed computer that might not have access to all that rich physical information. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm curious what you think about 
maybe the ways, because you talk about the potential of intelligence grounded in embodiment and the kinds, the way in which kind of entering into the world will shape that understanding. I mean, that's the kind of approach that phenomenologists took when they're kind of understanding um, embodied philosophy as well. How do you think that, I mean, a lot of the robots that we look at, like the now robot, are kind of anthropomorphic. You know, do you think that is sustaining new forms of intelligence and engagement? What kind of, um, what do you hope for us to do in imagining new robots and how will artistic practice help with um, that form of embodied intelligence? The anthropomorphic is so hard for me because we as people and Osama Khatib and Scott Delp have done some wonderful work on this at Stanford, but we, we as people, we've adapted over hundreds of thousands of years to minimize our energy when we're picking up a glass, right? So like the, the proportions of my arm are very good such that they minimize the amount of energy that I'm using to lift this thing and to bring it to my face. And being able to replicate that on a human, on a humanoid robot is fine or or like is interesting. It's one mode of investigation. But what I think is more interesting is saying, all right, let's let's think about making robots like in Alison Okamura's lab that are soft and compressible and they can be elongated through air, right? Like they're extensible, the vine robots, or you can make a robot that's the size of a bug. I think there's a professor um, up at UC Berkeley who's, and even Boston Dynamics, one of their earliest robots were these little like sand, yeah, Agnieszka knows um, these kind of sand hopping robots that didn't look like people at all. Um, and so I think there, you can certainly generate artificial physical intelligence from many different shapes and sizes of bodies. And we can kind of like go down the marketing rabbit hole as to why people make robots that look like people. Uh, but but I think it's more interesting to try to investigate like what are the edges of what robot bodies can look like and how can we you know create new types of sensing so that they can do things that humans wouldn't necessarily want to do and we can feel that extended possibility by the objects that we create, by the robots that we create. Yeah, just a little about uh, that, you know, because Rob, when we think about uh, environment, we have created, uh, you know, over centuries, uh, their environment made for people, but many of the jobs that people did are being taken over by robots. So the best example of this is when we think about logistics, uh, you know, Amazon, they still have people packing and putting stuff in boxes, but it's trans transferring into just robotics doing that. In Boston Dynamics, they have also a robot that's doing that. So actually the interesting question is gonna be how much, into looking into the future, how much crossword is gonna be between environments that are just for robots and robotics and for people. So it's a very interesting moment in time right now. So if you build a, build a warehouse right now, uh, do you build it like with windows, how you know the ceiling that's certain height so people can come in? So I think that's really very, very interesting. Um, yeah, in regard of the physicality that, that Katie's talking about, it's a lot about the environment. Right, because robots are in worlds and are we going to be able to inhabit the same world and move around in the same world? And so much of your work is kind of choreographic in tandem with them, but Agnieszka, you're describing the possibility of human movement being erased from that. Well, um, it's, I mean, it's, we are, we're living really an interesting time going forward to what's happening. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Well, I think one of the, one of the things we often see with artificial intelligence or when we speak about it, or when we see robots is it's always like a hundred percent replacement. It's like, we're going to build this super clever machine, which is going to like, um, replace everything we do or what I find frustrating often kind of like assumes that it has to interact with like either a complete uneducated or it, or like almost idiotic person. And so sometimes I miss a little bit like that. It's almost like has become like the replacement of education. It's like, let's forget, let's, let's stop teaching people like certain skills and let's just focus on robots because we're going to just do everything with robots. And, and like, I, I feel like about, like the concept of a call center, for instance, like when you call and like once upon a time, there was a person on the other end who actually knew the products and how they were made and, and, and you could call and would get an answer. And now you have to like call through like a lot of automated like systems. And in the end, you still kind of don't know, or then maybe you have a person there. And so 
I just sometimes like worry a little bit about the, the amount of effort and resource which goes about out into automating things and, 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 and then to what end. So I agree, it's much more interesting when we think about, about applications where we really can't go as people or, or, or shouldn't go. Um, and of course, on the way there is gonna be like some, some of that which is gonna replace maybe other things, but especially Amazon in that way is kind of like a frustrating model because it's just like dumbing down and dumbing down slowly that person who packs and it takes like one task after the other away. And it's like this process of dehumanization um, and like cutting their wage down when you could think um, that probably a lot of those resources could be used to kind of um, educate and have, um, and have still like some sort of robotics involved, but, but um, um, uh, in a much more dignified way. I don't know. So this like, sometimes I feel like about AI, a lot of the conversation uh, is, is there. Um, um. I would argue though, that when you look at like progression of history, like, you know, from a, a historical point of view or sociological point of view, uh, the mechanization of what we do as humans had always happened. It okay. just, so, you know, so craftsmanship, it always disappears. There's very few people who make a watch from the very beginning to the very end. It just wouldn't work, right? So you have to specialize to achieve more. And uh, so, we, so you know, as people, we become very good at one thing, and then the next progress is we, de we design a machine to replace us at that one thing. So I think that's been happening for centuries, really. Uh, I'm not sure if I am... For me, it's not really a negative thing. I think it just frees people to uh, do other things or have more time. And uh, like a craftsmanship, again, that makes a shoe from the beginning to the end, uh, I don't think we'll ever go back to that place. My sense too is that um, from both Karima and Anishka, what you're talking about is that one of the really wonderful possibilities for robotics is that you know, if we allow robots, we kind of design robots to be specialized in a way and sense in new kinds of ways, Kate, like you're talking about, then it can free humans for different kinds of activity that there doesn't have to be a kind of competition, but there can be new possibilities in both ends. And so I'd like to, um, one, of a, one of our uh, attendees has asked a question, I think, that relates to this. And so Tanya Black has asked that, so, Katie mentioned creating new types of sensing for robots. So given the conversation we've been having about what robotics can make possible, um, what kinds of new sensing would Katie and the rest of the panelists like to see developed that would maybe facilitate this future that we're talking about? I love this question and I think about this all the time because my hope is that we can use robots in many ways to amplify our own sensing capabilities. So. For example, there's a sort of category of sensors that are all the same types of sensors that we have, but in different bandwidths, right? So we know that with our rods and cones, we tend to detect certain wavelengths of light. We can see certain colors and cats are really good at seeing at night, for instance. Um, if you deploy a robot that is really good at seeing at night um, or uses depth, infrared, any of the other types of camera sensors that we don't have physical immediate access to, I think that is super intriguing. The same goes for things like smell, um, or, or sound, you know, we tend to have a specific bandwidth of hearing and you can create robots that are equipped with sensors that go much farther up and down that bandwidth. Um, I also think there's, there's things about the universe that we maybe don't immediately sense, but that we're aware of. So for example, the kind of like gravity of the earth, it's what allows us to stand and we have this plane that we're relative to constantly, but we don't, we don't actually sense that in any type of physical way, like that mag, I'm, um, you know, up on Mars, they use this, I think it's called a mass spectrometer to like blow up rocks and be able to look at what they're comprised of. Um, I just think about that's a type of information that we don't experience on a regular basis, like the, the magnetic or um, the magnetic properties of the earth, for example, what would it be like for a human being to be able to send something like that? Um, there's, there's also a sort of second category of sensing, which is like the human robot 
sensory augmentation and, and folks like the Cyborg Foundation and Moon Rebus and Neil Harbison, they all fit in this category of people who have like really, I have a friend, Benji Holson, who put a magnet in his finger so that he could be like a uh, Magneto and X-Men and pick up objects, right? So there's sort of like a whole secondary category of like sensory augmentation that we can't actually experience physically. And then the third thing is people are making new sensors all the time. Like there's, uh, a student, I'm gonna forget her name, but she's right down the lab from me at Stanford and she makes sensors out of these flexible mylar materials, which is actually what you use to make happy birthday balloons and things like that, where you can detect normal and shear from this like laser cutting that you put into these mylar materials. And so new sensors are, are appearing all the time that allow you to detect different kinds of forces in different ways or sounds. So maybe those are the three categories that I'm interested in. What is sort of this like idea of, of using robots that can broaden the bandwidth of human sensory capability or at least capture it somehow. The second one, which is this like cyborgian put things, you know, augment the body in some way. And then the third one, which is just like the scope of new sensors that are being generated all the time, which are going to open up brand new um, capabilities, you know, both for our robots and maybe even for ourselves, if we can figure out what that translation pipeline is. I would like a robot that, that the sense that you can argument yourself that you can smell from far away, just like eyes, but nose. Did you see something and you smell it? I think that would be really cool. Mm. Kurume, any um, I, any particular kinds of sensing you'd be interested in seeing? I think smell. I think better capabilities to smell would be very interesting. Um. Great. Well, this seems like um, with this conversation, but we'd like to see. I'm interested to hear um, if you each have a project or a long-term goal for your work. Um, and if you find that the technology we have now is sufficient to realize that, or is there an advance, maybe it's smelling, um, that you'd like to see, that you look forward to, to integrating um, in your own work? Well, well, it goes back to the touch and everything. Everything that Katie says, it just strikes a chord. It's so, we're so, uh, like as a painter, I'm so sensitive how we do stuff uh, with what speed and uh, and mixing and everything makes a difference. And like, I, I played with the idea, okay, what if I have a spot uh, to a painting, but they're pretty awkward. <laughs> so I would like to see, yeah, having better sensors so, in the, so they understand uh, softness or hardness of the material they work with and the surface they work with. Uh, so I guess, yeah, so I guess that would be my, um, um, my wish. I, okay, this is, you gotta roll with me here. Um, so I'm pretty obsessed something I talk about a lot is like when I dance with a robot, I feel this sense of transcendence. And Agnieszka, you were talking about this kind of spiritual experience, because for me, it's like I get to see a derivative of my body in some way reflected back to me, and then I get to touch and move around with it. And so I go in this like headspace of remembering what it was like to choreograph that robot, feeling what it's like in the present moment, and then imagining, you know, where we're, where the performance is headed next. So I would love to dance with robots in space. There are a lot of robots in space, um, like the Canada arm, you know, they, they are even teleoperated from earth. They're doing some really interesting stuff where they have this, I think it's a satellite that's going around the ISS. And like, every time it gets close to the ISS, it puts in a little teleoperation command. Um, and so I think it would be really incredible to dance with robots in zero gravity and kind of like be in a space suit with these robots around that I can like partner it, but I'm, I'm using them as my central point of gravity. So I just talked about gravity as like we're relative to this one plane on earth, but using just like the leverage forces of pushing and pulling on a robot in zero gravity, I think would be, so that's one thing I would like to realize in my work. I don't know if that will happen in my lifetime, but like for human beings to just like casually go up into space, let alone do uh, performances up there, but I would love to do that. I have a question to Katie. What do you think about the dancing cap capabilities of robots at Boston Dynamics? I, I assume you've seen that viral video. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked because it's such a cultural moment. Like this video came out and I think maybe 200 people sent it to me, like my mom, and this guy from eighth grade that I haven't talked to, you know, a lot of, and they were like, what's going on? So what I, I wrote a very long Twitter mega thread on this. So I'll, I'll try to condense what I said in that 
first of all, it's an incredible display of dynamic control. And like Boston Dynamics robots are the best in the world at, dy at dynamic control, right? So it was a scripted motion. They decided to choreograph these robots explicitly and they built this big challenging pipeline of like real to sim to real to get the robots to dance. Um, so on that point of view, highly impressive. And it's emotionally evocative because they're dancing to music. And Kareem's heard me talk about this, but we have this predisposition as human beings. It's how we've evolved to enjoy when things move in rhythmic synchronicity, whether it's birds or robots or humans. It's just like, and there's a lot of articles about this, which maybe I could send Vanessa afterwards, but it's this like predilection that humans have to moving in rhythm. And when you see that happening, regardless of whether you like robots or hate robots, it gets you excited. So for sure, everyone's going to respond to those videos in, a, in an emotionally charged way. Um, I think for me, what I thought we missed a little as a choreographer that could have been different, they were doing the mashed potato and the twist, which are two human dances, right? Those are social human dances that have a very clear meaning in our society and were used by a certain population at a certain time. And, and we just like, wow, we could have had these robots dance in a way that only act, you could have like turned the jerk all the way up and you would have gotten this like, zirp, zirp, zirp. like it would have been so unusual and different. But, but the interpretation was like doing a human dance. So I think there's a big possibility for the robots to dance in the future in a way that maybe isn't so inspired by human beings. That would be exciting for me. But I think it was a huge cultural moment. And obviously people, and we could talk, we could have a whole panel just about that video. <laughs> um, and I think there's a question in the chat, which maybe is, is examining issues like that a bit further. But um, what did you think about it, Agnieszka, when you saw it? Um, I do hear you, and you are professional in the field, so you have a different perspective. Uh, I understand that because uh, that's what you do. I actually do appreciate the, the clash and the, that they are, again, because they're very industrial looking. To have the industrial looking robots uh, dance, human dance, I, I like that. It's just very strange, and there's a lot of tension there. So it's like Hamilton when you have, you know, old language with hip hop, right? So I do like that. Uh, but but I, I do hear you. I would like to see a maybe more androids that are very human looking do what you're describing. I think that would be super cool, actually. Great. Um, we're winding down to the end of the hour, so I'd like to turn to the audience Q and A um, and address some of the questions that have come up. So first question is from Cal Svalatik who says he's curious about what your feelings are about Boston Dynamics being funded by DARPA and the US military um, and the entailing moral ethical issues there. Uh, no, not at all. I, I think, uh, I mean, it's a cliche answer, but they're just a tool. And I think if they, uh, if they can save lives or, um, it's a great thing. Uh, no, I don't have any problem with it. And I think a lot of cool technology comes from the military because otherwise no private company could ever pull together the amount of funding and, uh, and resources and time. So uh, not at all, no. Yeah, I think you're right in saying that, um, I mean, so many of our major technological infrastructures are, um, are coming from from military industrial complex. I mean, the internet was originally an industrial, um, uh, a military industrial tool. And uh, there's some recent work coming out too about the uh, articulations of art and technology research and kind of post-World War II that I think touched on these in very important ways. Um, all right, um, we have another question from Libish Lib M. How could robotic performances and swarming behavior change our perception of construction or travel? I can maybe provide a couple of thoughts here. Um, and maybe I, I also, I think it's a very nuanced, also back to Cal's question, um, you know, Boston Dynamics is, is one example of, a, I would say a variety of robotics companies that, um, yeah, have, have taken part not only in the military industrial complex, but Fred Turner from, um, from Stanford, and I'm sure Vanessa is very familiar with his work too. He talks a lot about the kind of interwovenness 
of government funded research and an R1 universities, right? So there's like a very long and distinctive history um, that comes about because in order to realize the kind of scale and capability of a lot of these projects, there's only a number of institutions that have those types of resources, right? So it might be government, it might be private companies, it might be research institutions, but there's not an unlimited number of institutions like NASA, for example, that can really fund some of these massively ambitious projects. Um, and, and Boston Dynamics grew from a research group, right? It was Mark Roberts group at MIT. Uh, he was originally in, um, investigating, yeah, dynamic motion and being able to create more efficient legs and things like that. So, so it is a very nuanced discussion. And I have to say, you know, one that I'm learning more, more and more about as I take my artistic process and incubate it inside of a university environment, really. Um, and then to the question about kind of drones, travel, swarms, um, I am fascinated by swarms. Actually, one of the pieces I'm working on right now, which is secret, uh, we we are just very interested in, in swarms and swarm behavior. And I think there's wonderful history in especially computer graphics of being able to simulate swarms with just a couple of control rules, like you know, maintain the same orientation, maintain the same distance between yourself and every other body you know, hit enter and you get these incredible swarm behaviors and patterns. Um, so I'm not sure I have a great answer for you about kind of the implications of drones and travel overall, all of which is to say that like swarms are themselves kind of like a living being and um, we can capture different kinds of works when, when we use a swarm versus a single robot. Um, all right, and we have a few minutes left. So just this last question, if anyone would like to quickly hop on, by Tanya Vlack, what type of happy accidents have happened in your work with robots that created a new line of inquiry? If any. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Well, I mean, I don't want to remain because you have not spoken much. I mean, I, I can talk about it, but uh, I would well, like It's just like there have been so many accidents that like to frame them as like a new line of inquiry. It's kind of interesting because it feels like it has been like one series of accidents. So the whole inquiry is kind of like <laughs> uh, uh, a game of, of, of like think, trying to do and then sometimes they turn out that way and then just look at the outcomes and keep going from there. So like, I guess it comes from like not being an engineer and trying to optimize the task. It's much more of a journey. So, uh, so there's so many accidents along the way. I mean, material melts different, paint goes off. Um, at the very beginning, a lot of accidents with like the software not doing what you wanted it to do. Uh, but then like, oh, oh, you know, we could use it for, um, uh, you know, like for more like, you know, like choreography or something like which wasn't like really something you would think of, right? And so, um, so, so it's hard to pinpoint one, but I'm going to think of one while you have, uh, while you say something maybe. Well, for me, definitely AR is actually 100% that. Uh, I mean, an accident in the sense that I went, uh, I went to Boston with an intention of just painting portraits, which are still, and then just because the movement was so charming and perhaps not an accident, but an accident in the sense that the environment really changed the way I think. And it just felt uh, that I need to honor the fact uh, how cool their movements are. And there's a whole new line, the whole new body of work in the show uh, that I'm getting ready for was an accident in that sense. All right, um, unless anyone has anything else to add, that seems like a good note to end our conversation on. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to thank you all and thank um, everyone for attending. Um, I'd also like to highlight at this point that Immersive Arts Alliance is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to place extraordinary performances and exhi exhibitions throughout the Bay Area accessible to all. Uh, we rely on contributions from individuals, corporations, and foundations to support the development and presentation of our programs. If you are so moved to contribute, the lion's share of your gift, more than 80%, goes directly to artists and arts programming. Um, I will share 
Immersive Arts Alliance's um, URL here. Please go visit and see what else is cooking. Thank you all so much for a fascinating discussion. There's obviously so much more to talk about. We could have, as you say, Katie, like a whole panel just on that video. Maybe we should. Um, thanks all. Take care. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.